Inasmuch as so gloomy a spirit was capable of so cheerful an emotion, Thanatos always enjoyed that moment when he manifested himself in front of those marked down for death, appearing before them invisible to no one else, his gaunt form cloaked in black, wisps of hellish gases streaming from him, he would stretch out his arm to his victims with a cruelly deliberate slowness. The moment he touched their flesh with the tip of his bony finger, there would come a piteous whimper from the soul within them. Thanatos took great delight in watching his victim's skin go pale, and the eyes flutter and film over as life was extinguished. Above all, he loved the sound of the soul's last shuddering sigh as it emerged from its mortal carcass and submitted itself to his manacles, ready to be led away. Sisyphus, like most wily, ambitious schemers, was a light sleeper. His mind was always churning, and the slightest noise could jerk him awake. Thus it was that even the silent whisper of death gliding into his bedchamber caused him to sit up. Who the hell are you? Who the hell indeed? The hell is just who I am. <laughs> Thanatos unloosed the sinister ghoulish laugh that so often sent dying mortals screaming mad. Stop groaning. What's the matter with you? Have you got a toothache? Indigestion? And don't talk in riddles. What is your name? My name. Thanatos paused for effect. My name. I haven't got all night. My name is... Have you even got a name? Thanatos. Oh... So you're death, are you? Hmm. Sisyphus seemed unimpressed. I thought you'd be taller. Sisyphus, son of Elos. Thanatos intoned in quelling accents. King of Corinth, Lord of... Yes, yes, I know who I am. You're the one who seems to have trouble remembering his name. Sit down, why don't you? Take the weight off your feet. My weight is not on my feet. I am hovering. Sisyphus looked down at the floor. Oh, yes, yes you are. And you come for me, have you? Not confident that any words of his would be received with the respect and all they deserved, Thanatos showed Sisyphus his manacles and shook them threateningly in his face. So you've brought shackles along. Iron? Steel. Unbreakable steel. Fetters forged in the fires of Hephaestus by Stirops the Cyclops. Enchanted by my lord Hades, whomsoever they bind cannot be unbound save by the god himself. Impressive, Sisyphus conceded, but in my experience, Nothing is unbreakable. Besides, there isn't even a lock or catch. The hasp and spring are too cunningly contrived to be seen by mortal eyes. So you say? I don't believe for a second that they work. I bet you can't close them around even your skinny arm. Go on, try. Such open ridicule of his prized manacles cannot be borne. Foolish man! cried Thanatos. Such intricate devices are beyond the understanding of a mortal. See here. Round my back once and pass in front. Easy. Bring my wrists together, then close up the bracelets. And if you would be good enough to press just here to engage the clasp, there's an invisible panel. And yes, behold! Ah, yes, I see, said Sisyphus thoughtfully. I do see. I was wrong, quite wrong. What superb workmanship. Mm -hmm. 
Thanatos tried to wave the manacles, but his whole upper body was now constrained and immobile. Mm. Help. Sisyphus sprang from his bed and opened the door of a large wardrobe at the end of the room. It was the simplest thing in the world to send the hovering, tightly bound Thanatos across the room. With one push, he had glided in and bumped his nose on the back of the door. Turning the key on him, Sisyphus called out cheerily, The lock to this wardrobe may be cheap and man-made, but I can assure you that it works as well as any fetters forged in the fires of Hephaestus. Muffled, despairing cries came, begging to be let out, but with a hearty <laughs> Sisyphus skipped away, deaf to death's entreaties. The first few days of Thanatos' imprisonment passed without incident. Neither Zeus, nor Hermes, nor even Hades himself thought to verify that Sisyphus had been checked into the infernal regions as arranged. But when a whole week passed without the arrival of any new dead souls, the spirits and demons of the underworld began to murmur. Another week went by, and not a single departed shade had been admitted for processing, save one venerable priestess of Artemis, whose blameless life merited the honor of a personal escort to Elysium by Hermes, the psychopomp. This sudden stemming of the flow of souls quite perplexed the denizens of Hades, until someone remarked that they hadn't seen Thanatos in days. Search parties were sent out, but death could not be found. Such a thing had never happened before. Without Thanatos, the whole system collapsed. In Olympus, opinion was divided. Dionysus found the whole situation hilarious and drank a toast to the end of lethal cirrhosis of the liver. Apollo, Artemis, and Poseidon were more or less neutral on the subject. Demeter feared that Persephone's authority as queen of the underworld was being flouted. The seasons over which mother and daughter had dominion required that life be constantly ended and begun again, and only the presence of death could achieve this. The impropriety of such a scandal made Hera quite indignant, which made Zeus restive in churn. The usually merry and irrepressible Hermes was anxious too, for the smooth running of the underworld was partly his responsibility. But it was Ares who found the situation most intolerable. He was outraged. He looked down and saw battles being fought in the human realm with their customary ferocity, yet no one was dying. Warriors were being run through with javelins, trampled by horses, gutted by chariot wheels, and beheaded by swords. But they would not die. It made a mockery of combat. If soldiers and civilians did not die, why then war had no point. It settled nothing. It achieved nothing. Neither side in a battle could ever win. Lesser deities were as divided over the issue as the Olympians. The Kyries continued to drink the blood of those filled in battle and could not care less what happened to their souls. Two of the Horai, Dika and Eunomia, agreed with Demeter that the absence of death upset the natural order of things. Their sister, Erini, the goddess of peace, could barely contain her delight. If the absence of death meant the absence of war, then surely her time had come. Ares nagged his parents Hera and Zeus with such incessant clamor that at last they could bear it no longer. They declared that Thanatos must be found. Hera demanded to know when he had last been seen. Surely, Hermes, said Zeus, it wasn't so long ago that you sent him to fetch the soul of that black-hearted villain Sisyphus. Damn! Hermes slapped his thigh in annoyance. Of course, Sisyphus! We sent Thanatos to chain him up and escort him to Hades. Wait, wait here. The wings at Hermes' heels fluttered, flickered, and hummed that he was gone. He returned in the blink of an eye. Sisyphus never reached the underworld. Thanatos was sent to Corinth to fetch him half a moon ago, and neither has been seen since. Corinth? roared Ares. What are we waiting for? The locked wardrobe in the bedchamber was soon found and wrenched open, revealing a humiliated Thanatos, sitting tearfully in the corner under some cloaks. 
Hermes took him to the infernal regions, where Hades waved his hand to release the enchanted manacles. We will speak about this later, Thanatos, he said. For the moment, a log gem of souls awaits you. First, let me fetch that villain Sisyphus sire, pleaded Thanatos. He won't be able to trick me twice. Hermes arched an eyebrow, but Hades looked across to Persephone, sitting in her throne next to his. She nodded. Thanatos was her favorite amongst all the servants of the underworld. Just to make sure you don't foul it up, grunted Hades, dismissing him with a wave of the hand. 